Welcome to Crest. I'm Tom Anderson and it's Thursday. Crest twice in one week. Why not? Especially with a person like this on the show. For our penultimate guest of the 2020 season, I've spoken to the Irish supercharger, GoPro ambassador and extreme traveller Owen mccarthy Deerin. From here, we're going to keep our last two release dates to Thursdays, so as to drop our last guest on a special anniversary date. More on that at the end of the show. Now, Season 1 might be drawing to a climactic close, but we are coming back in 2021 and we want your feedback. At the end of the series, our Instagram will share the link to a survey monkey which we're asking listeners to fill out so that producer Dodd and the team can have some food for thought during the off-season. The listeners make us, so we want to make sure that we're bringing out more of the stuff you like to hear. If you don't have Instagram, then you can still access the survey by simply emailing castcrest at gmail.com with just one word in the title of the email survey no need to punctuate or add for conversational pleasantries and we'll reply with the link as i said on monday we're eternally grateful to the crew at obsessive disorder who have put up some prizes if you leave your email your data will be handled in line with all relevant legislation too so there we go looking forward to hearing from as many of you as possible and in the meantime here we go it's the crazy slab hunter and the show's first Irish guest, Owen McCarthy Deering. There's surf travel, and then there's surf travel. Owen McCarthy Deering's approach falls at perhaps the more extreme end of the scale. If it's slabby and hard to get to, then all the better. This is a guy who has consistently sought out some of the most challenging surf trips on offer. What makes him tick and why does he do it? Owen's going to tell it all to Crest. Easiest trip you're going to take this year, mind Owen. You are in our virtual studio. How's the Emerald Isle looking today anyway? Any waves? Dear Gwitcher, it's Gar Margaret. Hello and thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Um, no waves here in the sunny Emerald Isle today. I think it's pretty pretty small everywhere, but a bit of promise of swell coming this week end, hopefully. Oh yeah, well here's hoping. Now, with our theme tune faded into the background for the next hour or so, allow me to elaborate a bit more on Owen and his traveller modus operandi. Since rising through the ranks as a hot Irish junior, and that's saying something about his surfing ability given the surge in the surfing standard there in the last two decades, Owen has carved a unique and impressive place in European, and indeed world, surf culture. Adept in the contest jersey as both a short and long border, Owen's first big trips were to destinations he'd essentially won his ticket to in the company of his national surf team. However, That was just the warm-up act. Zambia, Iceland, arriving at undisclosed Atlantic islands by boat, Owen isn't put off by much in his pursuit of uncrowded perfection. A partnership with GoPro has meant that many of these trips are duly accompanied by breathtaking footage too. Half a million views of one of his edits on Surfline suggests a pretty proficient aptitude for filmmaking. And, of course, finding these crazy waves is all well and good if you can't go over the ledge on them. Not an issue for Owen. We'll go on anything, say the guys who've been slab hunting with him on his beloved west coast of Ireland. Barrels aside, Owen, like many with that wanderlust gene, is also quite happy to take on other hare-brained ideas in the name of getting off the beaten path. Sailing has been a great way for him to get an even deeper understanding of the ocean and its rhythms. But landlocked travel is also something he's got quite a track record for. Excuse the pun. He even hiked the legendary Camino de Santiago across northern Spain for something different to do. Finding your own path is a hallmark of how you roll as a traveller, isn't it, Owen? But in your case, there's a surfing tradition which goes way back in your life. Was it five years old when you first headed out to Ross Nola? That's it indeed, yeah. Family holiday, Um, mom, dad, down the beach, camping away for a month or two on end and got to take my first... um, riding a surfboard there and the gentle rolling ways of Ross Nello, which I think you've um, passed through that town 
Once upon a time. Yes, I have. Yeah, beautiful place. You can drive a car on the beach there, can't exactly. you? Exactly. That's it. Well remembered. Yeah. So um, yeah. Oh, that was that was really cool. And then from then, just um, I suppose thanks to my thanks to my family, my um, parents who were keen surfers, um, would have had coast to coast trips from the east coast in Ireland all the way to the west coast regularly on weekends. Even started surfing the east coast very consistently with them. Um, a few of the more hardcore locals there as the waves are so fickle as as you have over there and your side across the Irish Sea in Wales. Yeah, of course. I, I got a good memory from Ross Nola actually of seeing a um, car get stuck and the tide sort of coming in around the car and uh, there's a fellow at Ross Nola that makes a, a quick 40 euros for towing people up the beach and he just basically <laughs> sits there all day and does that. You ever been stuck there? No, I've never been stuck but definitely definitely see that, seen that unfold a good few times in Ross uh, Nola. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, claimed, claimed a few cars or people's pride. Yeah. And, and you're from Wicklow on the East Coast originally and uh, it's rare to find a good surfer from there um is there much surf on that east coast so no it's 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 super fickle to be honest um way way more fickle than across the water in wales so it's it's really it started with a with a few with a few folk giving it a dig but interesting enough the first surf club in ireland was based um out of wicklow in bray and right. uh, one of the main um godfathers of Irish surfing um kevin cavey is from right. the east coast and uh yeah, is still is still surfing surfing that side that side of the country as well, and um, it's it right. a few hardcore locals and dad got involved, and I was going down to the beach, and um, I suppose then that's where the the hunt for waves and different corners uh, took place, and probably spawned spawned the traveling dream because you're already right. always traveling west to to get a to get a proper swell or or a proper reliable wave i think it was was kevin cavey was one of the sort of founders of the original irish surfing um yeah. was it federation or association in like what we're talking like the sort of mid 60s i think exactly yeah and he would have been one of the first um one of the first group of competitive surfers from ireland as well and i think that was yeah the, went to the worlds in san diego i think didn't that's he it, spot on yeah and brought brought yeah. some boards back and i think that was uh that was a, a real milestone for me was um looking up to him and i think he was the first um east coast surfer to represent ireland at a national level and i think i was i was the second or the, one of the first juniors oh wow well done senior team so that cool. was pretty cool and to have him to have him guide me uh, along with um my father and mother um was pretty special along with some of the east coast locals so it was definitely oh, well. a, a, definitely a really um really interesting time to grow up well do give him uh, crest's regards next time you uh, you run into him i will indeed um, in, in terms of a contest background then um you you then were in the irish national team and uh, you you picked up a couple of results the 2004 junior europeans so that's that that's the one that was in france am i right that's it indeed yeah i was actually and that's that's when i was having um having some success in the in the longboarding as well as the shortboarding back in those days. yeah so that was that was cool because I think that that was between Dad and Kevin Cavey who actually got me that longboard. It was a Gordon Smith longboard out of uh, America that I was uh, surfing at the time. I think, I, and I still still surf to this day. So that's a pretty cool um, that's a pretty cool memory. Crest's own uh, Rob Blythe was actually at that Europeans, and then you were at the Europeans one year later at uh, Costa de Caparica in Portugal. That's it, indeed. Yeah, and uh, and, and, and I was at that one, although I don't remember you at that one. <laughs> yeah, I think that was that was a that was a good good times. So remember the punchy beach breaks there. Um, yeah, and there was a, so a very good surf in the second or third round or something, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. And I remember, yeah, I remember that being a a real fun. That was, I think, uh, my transition from the junior to the senior ranks. Um, right, for a senior team trip. So that was a that was a bit of crack. All right, and you were shortboarding at that one, were you? That was shortboarding, yes. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Being able to, to surf a short and a long board then, right? I've heard it sort of said in in the sort of mainland uh, of the British Isles, um, you know, England, Wales, Scotland, people tend to say that the surf 
it's difficult to be kind of uh, a really committed multidiscipline surfer. I've also heard other people say, no, that's rubbish. You know, you, we have lots of really small, fickle waves that suit themselves to longboarding really nicely. Not that longboarding isn't something you can go slab hunting on, but how did you kind of get that balance in those early days? And when would you choose to longboard? When would you choose to shortboard? Yeah, good question. I think it was mostly during the summer ones, as 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 we're speaking now. You know, the, the waves have been pretty small um, on the West Coast. Obviously, the the longboarding was um, a bit easier on the East Coast because the waves are so fickle and they can be pretty um, mushy and, and flat at times. And then definitely it was more, yeah, you'd you'd longboard for the majority of the summer um, when the waves nice. are small and cruisy, and then you'd you'd get on the shortboard. Um, for the for the winter months and um, right, you know, get some proper waves. Still, we're talking family trips at this stage. Uh, that's where you kind of got your your first bits of travel experience. Yeah, exactly. Family trips then spawned in the in the teenage years to getting on the bus and throwing all the gear. Maybe a, a camping, or if you didn't have your tent, there's I remember there being a few uh, few um, there was like rundown amb- ambulances on the east key coast right. camp out yeah. in or big uh, those huge concrete um sewerage pipes that you could you could uh, camp in at night time um nice. so that, that always proved interesting and then yeah i suppose that transitioned to to college and trips with college crew and um yeah it was definitely it was definitely always to try and uh I suppose get out there, get out in the wild, get out, see see what what's the next around the next corner, next adventure. And uh, one of the first trips that you remember, wider than that, then was to uh, California. But you're not talking California in terms of uh, you know pleasant, warm beaches, you know those iconic lifeguard towers or anything. <laughs> you're talking about scary, cold Cali. Uh, ocean beach and uh, and even ano nuevo is this is this correct that's true yeah and that was all uh spawned uh spawned by dad thanks to, thanks to mom um right you know, we, we had relatives over there and and then dad uh pushing the boundaries about going down yeah highway one and, and tracking down a few more secluded spots and uh, i think even having a look at it look at mavs back in the day in the in the oh, early wow. days when when mavs got released and there's a little there's a cool little um harbor wave actually inside where mavericks is um and yeah. then, and there's, there's a little yeah. left-hand point around the back as well yeah over, exactly uh, mavericks if you climb over the over the verge yeah yeah we it can, can be surfed quite small like three feet or something exactly yeah and there was a there was a good crew on that actually more 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 than um was there the people we saw out at mavericks but i think it was a bit cross shore and windy uh the, right uh, when we were there but yeah no it was it was um some boves and then up in up in sausalito up at the marine headlands going north of yeah. san francisco as well yeah so so much potential and it's surprisingly uncrowded once you got out of the the city limits yeah. which which again is the, is the joy of going that extra it mile is. Yeah, I mean, my my dad used to live there for a couple of years. This was going quite a way back now, like maybe 20 years or something. And I remember going to a few spots with him and there used to be hardly anyone in the water. And then when I grew a bit older and uglier and I went back there again, um, and I got to know a few of the Santa Cruz surfers, actually. Um, and, and and I was told that basically the, the couple of spots that my dad used to take me to, Ano Nuevo and, uh, and Waddell Creek. I don't know if you're anywhere near Waddell Creek. Yeah, they're basically a, a, they're a breeding triangle. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're actually the the sharkiest West Coast spots on uh, in in all of the North America. Exactly. Yeah, I remember Ano Nuevo and to see the seal colony first seals everywhere yeah thousands of seals and then there was only i think there was only one or two guys out that day and uh we yeah. thought we'd hit the jackpot but probably i suppose you definitely don't think about sharks when you're from ireland or wales so yeah, it was, it was a they're bit, well fed anyway aren't they <laughs> yeah exactly you'd hope so All those seals. <laughs> american sharks you know <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> big bmi um, and then, uh, and then, and then, of course, if you've done those big trips out west in Ireland, you know some of the sort of camping setups and how scary some of those surf spots can be. You know, you feel like you're padding off the edge of the earth because you you are a bit of a slab hunter, aren't you? Yeah, so that's that's actually something that you definitely have to rain check yourself on times uh, when you do the, especially the solo missions. You know, being conscious that you're out on the end of a peninsula or something like that, and yeah. not not many people know where you are, so it's it's good to check in, give a buddy a call, let them know that you know if you don't 
get back in touch in in an hour in two hours maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe there'd be to be reason for a bit of concern so it's, it's and you good. pulled it to one close out too many yeah exactly yeah so um yeah no but it's also it's also just the, the exact same as as you said about Ana Nueva, it's just going that extra distance, going that extra mile, probably finding a wave that's maybe not as perfect, a little bit less sketchy. And right. um, yeah, seeing seeing how you can challenge yourself on it is 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 probably the the main thrill. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you've had that appetite since being a teenager, though, for, for slabs. And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, I mean, there's always been a really good crew. Grew up with um, some of the guys that I think maybe put Irish surfing on the map in terms of Fergal Smith and um then and there's a huge uh, bodyboard crew um as well that would have pushed the slab and then there's you know guys right. who really don't get enough credit in terms of the likes of Kane Kilcullen who charged right. big slabs, small slabs, um with little or no social media presence or recognition at all. Um, yeah, and I suppose they've always they've always set the bar, and it's been amazing rolling with them on trips um, down to France during the pro juniors, and then just along the west coast. Um, yeah, getting 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 some some tube time before uh, before the the spots are definitely getting more crowded these days. So for guys like you and Kane, those uh, west coast of France spots must uh, you know southwest France spots must just feel like. Uh, really kind of soft and cushy and, uh, and and easy yeah yeah exactly especially with there's i just think mul- multiples of a uh, dozen people out in the lineup as well so you you definitely have to get your uh your um your scrap on to get to get a to right. get a good wave or two but it was it was more about i suppose the experience and the culture of traveling and um the different yeah. foods and yeah that that was that was something that definitely added added a lot of flavor to the trips um rather than you know being out in a on a tent on the west coast on your own yeah uh, you, you, you served any of the famous scottish uh, or Irish slabs, then any other any other sort of really no- the notables, the quotable notables. Yeah, so um, I suppose luckily to get a link in with um, Fergal and the crew when they when Riley's um, was in the early days on the map. Yeah, um, and then the likes of then the the cliffs of Moher, um, but not nothing to such a significant size as the toe size, just smaller paddle days. Um, oh, just paddling. Yeah, just <laughs> just, 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 paddling. just some sketchy paddling. Um yeah, typical and, Irishman there. Yeah, and then and then the likes of Scotland. You mentioned Scotland, I suppose, yeah, you're talking about Terso East and and the, the yeah. tight knit crew up there, um that are you know, that are you know Chris Noble and and the guys that, yeah. that hold down the fort um, up there, which is it's a pretty pretty similar to Ireland. Definitely, the wind chill factor might even be a bit colder, and um, some some really nice waves as well, which is which is a which was a treat and lucky to go up there on a, a van trip um, with a buddy and and get lucky on a swell or two. So it's it's um, it's definitely comparable and equally as uh sketchy slabs in in some regions when you move out from terso east chris has really got those spots wired doesn't he exactly yeah 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 they're uh they're you, you can definitely tell that the local guys have put in put in a lot of time up there mm. and they've got the tide style and, and the winds um but it's it's um it's really nice having i suppose you know someone you can bounce off and someone you can um i suppose try and try and get a few barrels with show you the ropes i think one of the things i find interesting about your way of doing things owen is the way that you you know you're you're out there on the west coast in a tent on your own uh, but then at the same time through through those late teenage years and you know your early 20s you really did take contests and shredding seriously as well you know you, you, we mentioned already kane kilcullen you mentioned Fergal Smith, you know, these were contemporaries of yours and guys that you traveled and did pro junior contests with. Uh, and you also got a berth at the the high performance center in Australia, didn't you, as an 18 year old? Yeah, exactly. And that was with um, Fergal Smith and Hugh Galloway. So we went over and that was that was an amazing experience. Um, yeah, I mean, Ferg, Ferg was definitely setting the bar at that stage and um, 
it was just such a wealth of knowledge they had at the high performance center i think it was sasha stocker at the time who was who was the lead out there and he was a former ct um surfer so it was, it was amazing having... former world champion actually oh, in, uh, there if, you if go. we're talking amateur yeah, he was a, he was the isa world champion in oh i want to say 94 okay very good Right, yeah, well, possibly ninety two. Can't be sure. He definitely, he definitely still had an amazing skill set and um, working on video, um, surfing, training, um, total fitness was was amazing, and that was uh, actually a mad trip because we were based in Cabarita, which um, I'm not sure if that rings any bells or it probably didn't uh, when we were there at the time, but we um, we met a. a, a, a a young a young kid similar age to ourselves uh chris wilson as we knew him who yeah. formerly, formerly became known as uh chipper wilson uh one yeah. of the top um, aerial surfers in the world and we were flabbergasted looking him try pop shove it out in the out in the point of cabarita and you know was really welcomed by the surf community for the for the couple of months we stayed out there involved in the local board riders competitions and it was just it was a real eye-opener and i think for all the the opportunity that we we had to go discover Australia in terms of the Great Barrier Reef. I think we just literally got stuck between Cabarita and Snapper for for three months and surfed our brains out. It was it was amazing. That's, it sounds amazing. And how do you then take all that surfing promise and uh, you know that kind of the the life of Riley? God, I don't know. Can I say life of Riley to an Irish person? That's probably based on. <laughs> I don't know the origin of that idiom. Actually, do you? No, I'm not sure. I do actually. Yeah. How do you take all of that and 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 then roll it up into basically growing up? Because then you went to college in Galway, um, took science, because um, you're a grafter, aren't you? You're a hard work, you know, yeah. you're a hard working person. You're talking to me. I can see there. You're sitting in in scrubs. You're in a a surgery. Exactly. Um, you're a GP. That's correct. Yeah. So I suppose that was that was um, definitely a. Uh, a significant stage of my life in Galway. Um, it was a really strong surf club there. Um, linked in with a, a few great guys. Um, you know, uh, Ricky Whelan, who was the club captain. I think I was vice captain. And at the time, we were running um, the InterVarsity Surf, the National InterVarsity Surf Competitions um, in those right. days, trying to put together uh, college magazines. Um, I suppose it was, it was really enjoyable. And I suppose that led to an awareness that, you know, you like I had a massive interest in the human body. Um, just it's, it's amazing function, everything from the eyes to, you know, your muscle reflexes. Um, so that's when I, when I started developing a, a keen interest in, in um, medicine and uh, pursuing a career in that. But I suppose always had um, surfing as a, uh, you know, a, a really significant proportion of my life, and you know, met so many great friends and so many great surf trips. Went off to New Zealand on a van trip, I think, during college, um, in Galway, and um, explored the North and South Islands. That was that was uh, pretty pretty epic. You know, really good everything from really good raglan to scoring loads of barrels down in uh, Taranaki and um, surfing super fun stent road. So. You know, I suppose it just oh, it, Stent Road, I know. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a right hand point. Exactly. Just south of New Plymouth. Yeah, and just keeps wrapping, bending towards you. It's got the most Sunset Beach with about five guys out. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so I suppose it just I, I really liked I really liked the um the work hard, play hard mentality so that you could you could get your, your studies done and then um you know, really, really put yourself to the, to the test with surfing and go travel the world uh, during your time off and, and have some amazing adventures. And um, then from there, uh, you went to uh, to med school and that was in Limerick. So you've managed to keep it relatively close to, to good coast. That's it. Keep it, keep it coastal the whole way. That was a, that was definitely surfing, definitely dictated uh, a massive portion of my choices regarding being close to the water um and limerick limerick was great for that had some you know great friends um in in limerick uh and i suppose transition one of the films sounds out car and we'd be out to clare and lahinchway um every day even think i got to live for one of my um one of my medical placements out in spanish point so oh, yeah, yeah. um yeah, and that's that's where uh, I suppose the days at Riley's and um, 
the, uh, the cliffs um, really came to the fore and also then had to had had some really cool trips in terms of I think you mentioned earlier on Zambia so in medical college went on a medical elective um, out to Zambia which they call the heart of Africa which is landlocked in the middle of Africa and it had always been my, on my radar from grainy uh, YouTube videos was the, um, the standing barreling wave in the middle of the Zambezi River which is uh, which was uh, a long shot, but I brought my boards, much to the much to the laughs of my uh, medical colleagues at the time, and headed out to the, to the landlocked heart of Africa. Um, and it's it's a it's the the chances of scoring that wave are so crazy slim. It's I think only breaks twice a year. Uh, I think it's like November and July, which is one of the months I happen to be there. Uh, the, the the river levels, uh, water levels have to be very low, and then you need to get a flash flood in the uplands to get the surge downstream to hit the boulders and throw up a perfect, perfect barreling uh, tube. You know, head high wave that you're trekking down through a gorge in the middle of Africa. A couple of um, crocodiles in the water and you're uh solo <laughs> in the middle of this uh in the middle of this um mad and is it in the sort of the african wilderness you mentioned crocodiles you know are we talking about a, a sort of a setting that looks a bit like one of those uh wildlife documentaries yeah it's 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 crazy so it's not not too far outside of um livingston which is where um Zambezi Falls are, and it's on the border of uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe, and it's right. rapid number eleven. So there's a huge uh, rafting uh, culture there and um, kayaking culture. So they have they have the setup, and luckily enough, I get linked in with a local guide, um, and you're trekking down. I mean, you know, hundred, two hundred foot gorge, um, right. you know, in blistering sunshine, brown water guy telling it it's cool that 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 crocodile you know he's not too big he'd only bite your hand off <laughs> pretty pretty sure <laughs> who, needs I, who needs a hand yeah so uh yeah made it down there and you're you're sort of i think it's rap number 11 i think it's it's claimed you know i think 10 to 12 lives over the last 10 years of um kayakers and rafters Gosh. who've gone back and um i mean you're you're hopping in quite a quite a while upstream paddling down backwards and just once i mean i think i went over the falls a good dozen times before i got it dialed and uh every time you go over the falls or get sucked down backstream through the through the rapids you've got like a 30 minute hike back to get to the oh, jump wow. off point so it's really uh grueling but once you get once you get on it you get i suppose you've really got unlimited unlimited barrel time which is uh it's something like i've never experienced before anyway important to ride the right board yeah i think the the biggest thing they were i, I suppose from the kayak perspective was uh, make sure you have some type of flotation um at the time right. i remember trying to find a um, impact vest or get a wakeboard one they weren't really common in surfing back then so i had to wear a bulky enough um life jacket but uh, i suppose the rapid uh the, the rapid or the narrowing and the rapids behind the wave is so significant it can it can drag you down and pummel you and not let you up for a considerable amount of time so i suppose the, the main thing is is the the flotation but I, I was just riding a standard um standard enough shortboard at the time wow and this is during your training yeah this is during a medical elective so we went over to um to lusaka which is the capital of zambia and outside lusaka it's uh there's a significant um patient population with hiv and and lots of lots of um lots of ailments from that and conditions and medical issues so we were in a right. in a rural clinic um i suppose as 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 uh, doctors trying to trying to help out um the locals in in whichever way we could um and we would have been there for uh, a month or two and yeah had a, had a, had an amazing crew um luckily uh, in terms of my medical colleagues who understood the surf and passion and um yeah martin brian and uh, emer who 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 accompanied me on the on the trip um down to livingston to to score to score some waves is it quite rewarding work 
you know it's a it's amazing uh it's amazing it's amazing work um especially i suppose in in a part of the world where you know compared to our western world here they have so little yet um yeah. they they can be happy um with such uh, simplicity and just a few simple treatments um can right. make can make the world of a difference you know to uh to to anywhere down there when where they have limited limited resources um and you know you you can really see how just something as simple as good antibiotics can can make a world of difference for for someone in a, in a bad situation because survival now with you know or, or life expectancy with hiv is now here in the western world at least equal isn't it yeah there's not there's not that much difference in in terms of um hiv su- survival um when you're on the the correct uh, drugs um but yeah. i suppose in africa it's you know it's a huge thing is still education I, at least when i was there which is um you know nearly 10 years ago now or more than 10 years ago but i mean education and the fact that you know a lot of people would have gone to to witch, doc- witch doctors there was a lot of right. thought that you know HIV was a uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't a as far as a, I suppose a an illness so such as more as a as a um, you know a force of God or a force of nature or something like that right. to try and to try and change the education um, yeah and that around it was 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 something that the uh, you know the healthcare in Zambia was working greatly on and a massive uh, portion of the the Zambian healthcare which is why we ended up there is um, Irish Irish funded uh, thanks right thanks to the generosity of the Irish people wonderful is is, is there a, a historical connection between Ireland or Z- and Zambia or is it just uh, I, think, I think just an altruism thing no, from I, Ireland's part? I, I think there's um, a lot of a, a uh, a lot of the um, the the Catholic Church, um, right? Where, okay, I from, see that from Irish yeah. uh, would have would have headed over there, and then I think there was also some link we we ended up learning about at the time that there was a, a beef or a, or a trade um, trade link as well in terms of uh, right beef as well. And uh, was your trip to Iceland because you went to Iceland before Iceland was that much of a thing in surfing really didn't you was that while training as well or was that just after? yeah no that was that was while training um so yeah that, that was uh again i think that's when i was living out in out in clare um and that was a, a pretty uh lucky connection um with through fergal smith and and mickey smith who who would have been around in ireland at the time um and the, the fact that it was you know i suppose a very uncharted territory and an ex-girlfriend who was who was keen to go explore iceland in in november so that was uh that was a that was an amazing trip I mean, <laughs> camping camping up in um in iceland in november in minus 20 degrees blizzards surfing in blizzards and uh yeah i suppose just exploring the the southern coast there um and the and the amount of potential i mean i think they had there was a, a very small storm rider guide section on it um at the time with a few spots and then and then you know going further afield and exploring the south coast to to find just i suppose mostly stunning scenery but also just i mean fantastic fantastic waves with no one around as long as you're able to keep warm enough to surf them uh with with some icebergs floating past um and wow. th- there within lies one of the stories that you were mentioning about getting stuck in the sand i mean i remember parking on the black sand beach just um just outside Yux- the yuxler on uh lagoon which is the ice lagoon with the glacier melting and flowing out into the sea i'm not sure if the pronunciation is correct there but essentially parking on the ice with the with the tight um the tight sun uh, daylight window you know i think it was like five to six hours in november and uh, getting out for a surf to to find the car had been uh, parked on frozen sand and the uh, the sun had unfortunately melted the sand or melted the ice in the sand and uh, the car was oh, no. stuck. So thanks to some kind Icelandic people with a with a souped up four by four came came to our rescue after uh, after an hour. It's your bit of Ross Nola karma. <laughs> that's it. That's it, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. And it's it's around about this stage then in your uh, well career, we've got the surfing career and the medical career running alongside each other that you 
begin your partnership with GoPro then? Yeah, no. So that actually that 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 it yep that that had been ongoing um for for some time. That I think that had been ongoing for three years at the time, but it was it was slow initially because back back when I um took. Uh, took on board the, the the setup of GoPro in Ireland and and its distribution. I mean, it really was a you know it was like a, a disposable airport camera in a in a uh, in a plastic housing, and then slowly progressed to a three megapixel pinhole camera. Um, so the so the uptake was tricky. It took definitely a good few years to get it off going. No nobody had heard of it before. Nobody had any customers coming in asking for it, so it was it was a slog. But I think it was around the time, um, towards the end of of like you said, that timeline in, in medicine in Limerick that uh, I suppose the global awareness of GoPro really kicked off, and it became a market leader. And that's when, yeah, things just went from zero to ninety in terms of uh, sales, the interest from shops, um, the amount of uh, GoPros getting shipped and sold here was um, phenomenal. And that was something that I suppose I was nearly working two do- jobs at the time, um, studying full-time in Limerick for medicine and also uh, distributing GoPros in Ireland. Um, and yeah, luckily enough then at, the, at that was that was the the next trip was at the end of the medical career as a as a celebration of or the me- medical studies as a celebration of finishing Limerick went off on a um on a really uh really far fetched trip to Western Sumatra. So flew into Madan overland from Madan to um to the to the uh, to the Sumatran coast, Sumatran Straits, over to Mas- Sumatran Straits to the Thousand Island chain, and ended up camping on a deserted island, um, getting dropped off with all our food, water, um, some sparse fishing equipment, and uh, camped out for two weeks with a with an eclectic crew um, with a stunning array of waves, everything from uh rights and lefts to uh to a nice right hand slab out the back of the bay which was um phenomenal but definitely 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 skirted the border of um suffering not surfing when we uh f- failed to catch barely two fish in two weeks <laughs> so you're just talking about camping out in the tropics and then you've also just talked about camping in the uh frozen Tundras, is that the right word of uh, yeah. of Iceland? Uh, which ones? Uh, oh, can I say which ones better? Which ones harder? Oh, um, definitely have to have to say I I'm uh, a fan of the the cold. I suppose growing up in Ireland, um, yeah, I'm built with my uh, red hair and freckled skin and blue eyes. I'm definitely built um, to with. So the tropics is harder. The tropics is so much harder with. Uh, yeah, the sun cream, the non-stop heat, the the mosquitoes, um, yeah. and yet you guys decided to try and do it with like catching your own fish and everything. Yeah, we we brought. I think there was like ten ten gallon drums of water out with us, flour, um, dry noodles, everything. It was a full on feral mission, and it was just. Uh, I suppose it was grueling. Like it was. It was a tough slog, um, you know. I, I suppose paddling across the, the bay. I'd say the amount of sun cream we used was insane. Um, but lucky, lucky, I had a really good crew. I had a Scottish guy who was working up in um, the, the IT department for, you know, I think up uh, up in the Scottish um, security services. Then there was a an Italian, an Italian. Um, dj producer who also was from rome and then a uh an english um an english uh <clears throat> mathematician with a phd the, and the, the the third guy was a um an italian league of three um goalkeeper wow a professional goalkeeper so it was an eclectic mix and it was a definitely a wild ride um but we survived and and at the at the very last point of the trip after um the scottish guy getting riddled with uh mosquito bites i mean there must have been 30 to 40 bites on his back and thinking of bailing early um when we were wrapping up the trip 
myself and the um, Italian Liga 3 goalkeeper were heading back across the Western Sumatra t- Straits in this tiny um, wooden dinghy powered by one of the local fishermen who I suppose maybe mistimed it or was uh, unsure of the, the this dramatic sea fog that came down and blocked out any any um any element of vision that we had i think we couldn't even see three to four feet in front of us is crazy um and without a without a compass or without any landmarks we were um i suppose set adrift in the western Sumatra straits with uh with a, a footballer who's trying to get back to sign his contract for next year who's losing who's losing his uh losing his cool at the at the um the local fishermen and uh, the local fishermen's wanting to wait it out all day in the blister and heat until um, nightfall so we could see the lights of other ships and um, myself and you know with minimal supplies a couple of drops of water between us and I got a I think I had most of my body covered but obviously was working away in my hands and uh, I think we were trying to hand paddle to try and get phone signal, even though it, it never happened. And uh, yeah, I got, got so badly burnt in my hands. I got absolute, uh, absolutely covered in blisters on the back of my hands. And right. uh, fi- finally got saved by a, um, a Chinese, uh, a Chinese um, fishing crew who happened to be just appear out of the mist and uh, tow our boat until we, we get signals i think it was something like eight hours later and uh they they had a good laugh at our expense anyway but we 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 finally made it back to the mainland um much to the much to the joy of the uh of the, the football player who's going back to renew his contract <laughs> and uh was, was that the, you recorded lots of that trip with the gopro then as well yeah we, we recorded that trip um ultimately i think we, we didn't uh, do anything with that. Just was, I think we were probably so thankful to 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 make it out alive. But um, yeah, we definitely. I'm sure there's definitely some some cool photos and cool footage there. Um, it was, I think, at at, at the time working with GoPros, it was crazy the amount of footage you were amassing. You're talking about fo- uh, you know hard drives and hard drives of footage. Right. A lot of it that you didn't didn't get to see the light of day, but. Thankfully, a few few edits like the Iceland edit and um, a special one from home as well made it made it made it onto the onto the big screen. Yeah, and that was the one with the the surf line one got to half a million views. Exactly, Which one was that? That was Iceland. Right. Yeah. Congratulations! So, That's amazing. Ah, thanks very much. Well, it was uh, yeah, it was just I suppose lucky timing with the waves and yeah like uh, amazing weather and uh, good support from gopro at the time made it made it all possible fab right let's talk about some of these other journeys besides surfing that you've done then and uh, the one that i find really interesting to ask you about is the camino de um Santiago. Santiago. um so this is this is or the, the the trail of saint james that's correct yeah and um, actually, I think it originally, on, originally starts in Ireland. Um, Does it? Interest, yeah. And um, obviously, it's by sea for some of it, but tracks over. And there's, I think, there's um, pathways or trails all down through mainland Europe, France, Spain, Portugal. I uh, even met people who'd followed some of the paths from Austria, Germany. So it's um, really extensive. But yeah, it's it's got its origin or its root in Ireland, which I, I think is pretty pretty interesting. And um, this was a yeah, I suppose it was a it was definitely a, a big decision for me to make take a non uh, non surf related trip. Um, but luckily, I got to walk the northern route um, in Spain. So. Um, flew into Biarritz and walked across the border to Arun and then walked all the way from the French-Spanish border along the northern coast of Spain all the way to San- Santiago de Compostela, which is um, 800 kilometers. How long did that take? So that took about a month. And the funny thing is I went into it with a surfing injury. I'd torn two ligaments in my <clears throat> 
right ankle and um they they uh, that that had happened only the week before I was due to leave and swollen up my foot pretty 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 big so I decided to walk the first 200 kilometers barefoot um just to take the pressure off the the foot um with the with the tightness of the shoe around it so that was that was pretty interesting definitely made you conscious of every every step you took and uh focus focused on uh the walking and and your footsteps rather than i suppose just being in in a daydream for most of it which was an interesting experience and um did it off peak in october september october time which is harvest season so that was absolutely amazing in terms of the the amount of just free hanging fruit and food that you could get on the roadsides in northern spain everything from walnuts to grapes apples oranges um and it was just i suppose spectacular countryside spectacular people um and it was yeah just i suppose a very much a a more low-key less high octane trip that um that i i would massively recommend to anyone is probably one of the favorite trips i've ever done and you meet must have met some very interesting people because uh you know everyone's a pilgrim yeah exactly and i think that was a really interesting thing was because it was off peak there wasn't a a rush or a pressure to get to the to the refuges or the pilgrim hostels that are five euro a night so it was uh it was sort of a mix match crew of people who 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 met along the way everyone from dock workers retired dock workers from belgium from austrian austrian um 20 year olds who'd walked from austria to italian cooks and um you know uh, an older uh spanish lady or two um who who were trekking along and uh you know everyone had their own story and everyone had their own i suppose view on life and where they were where their path was leading them and it was just inspiring and then you know to have that camaraderie have that engagement in the evening times then followed by days that you'd you'd walk alone and you you wouldn't you wouldn't meet anyone else really bar bar a a few town folk of the villages you pass through it was um just spectacular are you religious is that the reason for taking the journey um i i'm from a religious uh family and definitely there's i suppose a religious theme to 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 the the um santiago um walk but i suppose you know i think there's lots of people who do it for many reasons and i think it's it's most importantly i i felt along with the the religious sides if if you wish it was just a break from the the mad hamster wheel of of western world life where you know you always have to plan um your next move or you know keep keep the focus on where you're going to go next where this was just put one foot in front of each other and um see see what what town you want to you want to stay in that night see what you want to eat for grub see how you want how far you want to walk that day um so it was very much a a a simple 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 life approach to um to the to the whole walk rather than you know i I suppose a a fervent religious um journey right did you you know when you got there though then you went into the cathedral and would you have taken a eucharist and and uh sort of it does is that what what completes the pilgrimage or you know what's actually oh. there at the, at the end besides that cathedral oh so you get you yeah so the for the pilgrimage you you um you get a little pilgrim's um passport essentially so you get right. stamps along the way and um in every in every host or in every refuge you stay in and the the stamps then accumulate in a, a sort of a certificate I suppose right. of um, of completion of the Santiago, um, yeah. but I think I think the prerequisite for that is only a hundred or two hundred kilometers. So a lot of people just do the last leg of it, do the last bit, yeah. <laughs> rather than rather than the full thing. I've sat actually in the um, the last of those refuges at this on the on the Camino, the one that overlooks the square, and it's like a big swanky hotel. <laughs> and I think I had a sort of a you know a, an expensive coffee and a and a biscuit and uh, and watched the pilgrims arriving. 
the and the rapture on the looks of some of these guys' faces. You know, lots of them they just sort of stand there for an hour or two. You know, they just sit on the square and sort of stare at the cathedral, and you know, they kind of can't believe that they're there. Uh, was it a big moment when you finished it? Oh, definitely. It was. It was. Uh, yeah. It was. It was. It, I think it's just amazing as well how your body adapts. You know, and um, I suppose yeah, like back to that goal setting. You're just trying to uh, initially. You're trying to walk like twenty kilometers a day. That builds yeah. up to by the end of the by the end of it. Well, you're able. Well, I was able to walk. You know, forty, forty five plus kilometers a day. Um, yeah, which which I thought was pretty pretty cool, and then to to reach yeah the the end of the 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 end of the yeah. the, the, the pilgrim, and then to be met by a friend or two, one of the Italian chefs, um, and to have just yeah a bit of a rejoicing and connection, and I think we went out to Finisterre, um, oh, the, wow. the end of yeah, the world, the, the, the next yeah. day, and went for a swim, and that was just really top top yeah. the whole thing off nicely. You know the name, um, yeah, that's Santiago. So, so Iago um, is is another word for James. You know, like mm. Jacob. Um, and uh, I, I, I sort of forgive me if I'm telling you something you already know here, but um, it, it, essentially, what happened there with we've got San Iago it became Sant Iago, and one one suggestion is that a T was put into a sign at some point just because they were sort of, you know, middle ages sign writers enjoyed being able to play around with letters to see how they'd fit on a sign. And then somebody cut it in the wrong place again, then it became San Tiago. And then the name Tiago was born. So if you ever meet someone called Tiago or you have to surf against them, you should nudge them on the shoulder beforehand and say, are you aware that your name is to James? <laughs> that's very cool i hadn't heard that one before now in fairness yeah i said it to tiago perez once but uh how how did he respond oh i think he added an extra couple of points to every wave he surfed against me in the uh in the coming half hour and uh yeah yeah, i i i I walked home with my head hung (laughs) yeah so uh, and also talking about the you know the, the the break from the hamster wheel sailing um you're you're into that too and you you've yeah, what well, you sailed was the Caribbean your first big sailing trip? No, so I actually don't really have a background in, in sailing at all. But um, thanks to um, but, but why let that hold you back? Exactly, yeah. So thanks to a good buddy of mine from actually uh, college in Galway, um, who interesting when you're when you're talking about uh, religious um, lifestyles, ended up becoming a, a Buddhist monk. Um, wow. is, a, is a Buddhist monk in in England. Um, to this day but he his 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 father actually um and it was always a plan to sail together as as mates from from Galway but his his father um owned a owned a sailing boat and luckily I got to link in with a with a crew of I think six or seven others and after the Camino right. um went to went to the Canaries sailed from the Canaries um down south to the Cape Verdes and then sailed from the Cape Verdes across the Caribbean and luckily enough was able to bring my surfboards along for the ride so that was uh, pretty special because I was able to um, do some exploration on uh, both sides of the Atlantic which was which was just amazing to have that access from uh, from a water side of yeah. things rather than land and you know found some incredible waves um and how, how quickly does the knowledge and skill arrive um i suppose you're doing pretty basic tasks uh, um at first on on the on the sailboat um like a deckhand make sure everything's clean and ship shape but i suppose it, it it does it does progress quite naturally from your knowledge from surfing from tides currents um the wind um, and then you're able to, to to develop that into, I suppose, what what makes what what works, um, what makes the boat go, and uh, yeah. you know, I suppose you you I definitely felt as as someone who spent most of their uh, life in the water, um, very comfortable um, out in the middle of the Atlantic, despite all the storms we hit, and the crazy weather and and the doldrums as well, or the flat seas with no wind, um, I felt very comfortable and, and never really. I suppose felt as if there was any um, grave danger, even when we snapped our boom clean off, um, and even when we nearly lost a lost um, lost a guy overboard. It was uh, it was um, I suppose it was it, I just embraced it all, and it was uh, it was a it was a serious adventure, and um, I suppose yeah, something something pretty cool. As a surfer, probably your 
so we're bringing it back around to surfing a little bit now probably your sort of biggest um achievement as a sailing surfer though was um finding um the the long hollow right in a in a we're not going to name the location of this place um but it's known as nacho's wave named after the basque charger um the the, the that right that some of you may have seen has a has a fabulous sort of red salt marsh foreground uh, was featured in a big surfers journal article and there have been some videos of it and you've been there and surfed it i mean it's it's basically skeleton point backwards isn't it exactly yeah it was crazy to come across in that um you know uh, it was uh, should we give the kind of region we're sort of talking oh, it's like, the, the atlantic <laughs> yeah <laughs> northern hemisphere atlantic right yeah um but i suppose it's it was that was stunning to try and um you know, northern hemisphere atlantic and south of ireland yeah, yeah. uh to try and um just, well, south of europe let's go a bit further yeah decipher the decipher the um you know the the contours of the of the land and you know the possibility that a way you could be shaped there and then to go i suppose search it out um on a whim and just get really get lucky again with a with a swell and to be to be there solo um you know with a few crew members who probably didn't really really get the whole buzz of it but uh find this draining um right point over sand and see how i suppose heavy and hollow it was and i i mean that was definitely one of those points where i nearly wish had someone with me to share it with it was um it was it was uh it was crazy and you know to be so isolated and remote uh with my i mean really minimal backup um if anything did go awry um and, and being conscious of that but it was it was um definitely really special and i suppose it was you know understandable it got got blown open to the masses um to some degree but you know i think i i'd been there maybe two or three years before um it hit the mainstream um internet and uh was just very happy to keep it as a as a little special place uh in my heart and my head and you know hope 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 hopefully hope to get back there with um some equal equally clean chargers such as yourself maybe uh give it a stab again someday i'm uh, uh yeah we, we, we're going to be discussing some of these arrangements off air but uh yeah we're keen as mustard definitely <laughs> um doesn't all it doesn't always go to plan all the time though does it because we're talking about if we reverse it the other way skeleton point that's somewhere that you did get skunked yeah i got, got majorly skunked um lucky to be in yeah went to down to south africa with a good buddy of mine uh, shane o'connor also a uh even more prolific um irish slab heart charger and hunter and uh yeah we found ourselves down surfing around by cape town and um saw two swells for skeleton bay and unfortunately went on the second one instead of the first one and oh, uh, no. got, got pretty shafted you should have been here yesterday yeah, then, and it was uh, actually there was a, a moroccan guy who was camped out um at skeleton bay which is a it's a tough tough place to be for a long period of time i mean there's nothing much there aside from a, a mining shipping port but he he'd hung on for a month or two and <clears throat> it was showing us footage and telling them so was, um you know overhead skeleton points sonny that he had to himself with all his gopro footage so i mean that was definitely a, a bit of a sting but look it was a it was a great adventure and namibia is a beautiful country um the sand dunes and you know we, we still enjoyed the thrill of it um i went back on to score uh pretty pretty pumping late season J bay so that was um that was that was pretty special and i'm trying to think of other another another significant skunk that comes to mind is going going the distance to east timor or timor leste which is um well at the time it was one of the second newest countries in the world um only superseded by south sudan i think so ended up um in east timor just after the un had sort of cleared out and the civil war right. had ended and uh on a mission to find some um, uncharted waves in a in an island rivered with uh, salt saltwater crocodiles, but um, unfortunately, dis despite traversing the whole coast and even uh, one of the islands um, on uh, off off offshore from it, uh, ended up only getting 
sort of yeah two foot two foot chop at the end of it but again still a a, a, a stunning stunning country with really minimal tourism and no infrastructure and happy happy go lucky people and an amazing rich culture and and heritage there as well which is which is uh equally as fascinating as scoring a good wave i mean that that's the attitude to take isn't it when you don't get if you don't score you know you still it's still travel exactly yeah and i I suppose to have to have the people to do it with and to have sometimes the people to bounce off like my friend james gork who was based out in east timor at the time uh doing some work for the un um to have those to have those contacts to link in with um and you know because a lot of these i suppose more far-flung places require visas or um, yes. special privileges to get to and you have to i suppose have some awareness or know the ropes um so i've been lucky lucky to have to have people to bounce off um for these trips as well which is which is uh which makes them very very unique uh now you post uh, on instagram quite a lot of wonderful surfing footage and quite a lot of footage you know sort of landscape footage as well and you know various stuff that you pick up a lot of it done with the gopros um and you write your captions in gaelic you're a gaelic speaker yeah shenay um tommy leaf squelga so exactly i'm uh, fluent in irish thanks to going to an all irish oh you call it irish should i be calling it irish, no, I irish or, 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 Gaelga is the um the correct term for it. um so Face the skull long Gaelic. Um, I was in an all Irish uh, secondary school, and um, yeah, I suppose I, I think you know uh, there's a there's a phrase in Irish, um, uh, "Cheer gan Changa is cheer gan anam." So that means uh, a country without a language is a country without a soul. So I th- I think it's really important oh, wow. that we you know we um, foster and respect and um, promote the Irish language um, and. Uh, Gaelic in Ireland, and then there's Scots Gaelic, and I and I think it's, you know, the the um, the real true uh, spoken word in Ireland that has all the history and and meaning and culture um, evolved into it, and, and you know, there's um, Gaeltox or areas of Ireland that uh, the people only speak Gaelic. Um, and I think that's, again, like we spoke about in terms of trips afar, I think to have that culture, to have that significance, to have that um, history, I think is is a, a beautiful and inspiring thing. And I'm really proud and happy to be uh, a fluent um, Irish speaker. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose writing the post on Instagram, hope hope to share to uh, a wider audience and, and promote it uh, amongst I suppose the new up and coming generations here in Wales, I've got absolute respect to that. Um, as a Welsh speaker myself, I think that, uh, exactly what you just said, the, the language is the, the sort of really, really, really important thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I think it looks in Wales as though we have saved it as though it is on the way back. How, how is the language looking in Ireland? Is it, is it secure? Yeah, I think, I think definitely in, in terms of the, the Gwaeltooks or the Irish, uh, speaking, uh, language areas, I think it's, it's secure. And I think, um, there, you know, I would have campaigned when I was in my school years to, to make sure it's, it's kept as a, as a European language, an official European language. So I think, um, the likes of, um, Irish radio and radio, to, radio and well to, to Irish TV in terms of, um, uh, Telefish, um, TG Carr, um, I think are, are, are massive. And, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, people doing, doing great work to, to promote the Irish language and, and to keep it at the forefront of, um, I suppose the agenda in Ireland. And I think, you know, there, there's, there's been a revival of, of of sorts and i i think it's got um got the right trajectory and it's it's got a good way to go and hopefully it's onwards and upward from here on out and another connection you share with wales then is your uh your main sponsor uh elusive clothing uh, a welsh-based company and uh, that brings you over to wales quite a bit doesn't it you always do the elusive open when it's held and uh, you've been over a few times to sort of meet up with the elusive guys exactly yeah and i can't can't uh, be more thankful to nick Clure, um the, the mastermind behind elusive and uh, such a such a reputable family-owned brand with you know sustainable nature and uh, using um 
organic and recycled cotton to to make most of their their clothing which is uh something you can easily get behind as an environmental conscious surfer so i, I think it's it's been amazing to have this sport over i think it's 10 12 years now from elusive and to to link in with all the welsh welsh guys um for the uh the the welsh open and um you know to just have such a such a good connection with i think i suppose um a similar uh culture and background in terms of people who are able to have the crack and really uh enjoy surfing and no more so than yourself who's um you know passionate about the surfing passionate about whales and uh passionate about you know sporting good brands i think it's um it's really really something that inspires me every day nick told me that when you came on i had to ask you about uh, a tale of him and a couple of others planning to go to the Maldives with you on a boat trip and and they they couldn't find you before leaving for the boat and then they found you sleeping emaciated under a tree and you'd been sleeping for sort of 10 hours just lying under this tree not sure when you were going to see them and he said you you literally were Robinson Crusoe or you looked like that at the time um, he said he says I've got to ask you about it but I'm wondering if you've already told us about it was it straight after Western Sumatra it was straight after Western Sumatra yeah I think we'd, we'd pretty oh, much right. been uh, ran out of all our food ran out of our water couldn't couldn't catch any fish even though every time you looked under the under the surface of the water there was like 20 fish to see it every uh, god-given time but uh listen yeah just about just about survived it so i, I wasn't I, I couldn't have been more stoked to join the elusive team on a on a on a you know a all-inclusive uh, boat trip where you got your three meals a day and got to surf our brains out so that was uh that was absolutely stunning and yeah big, big shout out to all the guys who were on that trip and, and nick for putting it together because that was the real cherry on the cake after after surviving western sumatra before you leave us, Owen, I want to check whether we've sort of left anything out here now. You know, we've been on Maldives boat trips. We've surfed uh, river bores in, oh, no, bores, no, river, standing river waves in the Zambesi. Oh, is, is there a standing river wave in Limerick as well? I'm, I'm sure oh, I've seen one is. in yeah, the time. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, yeah, I yeah, spent, spent, my, spent my college days in Limerick uh, when I didn't have enough time to get to the coast or on my lunch break, sir. It looks like quite a hard one. I've watched it. Yeah, I didn't go it's, out. It's very, it's 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 uh, very tricky, and um, but it's it's just that it's so accessible. It's right in the middle of Limerick City, and it's yeah. uh, good good crack. You can get uh, you know the odd turn or two in on it, and um, yeah, it's 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 just uh, like like all the surfers know. It's about uh, uh, half the battle is just getting out there and getting wet and having a, having a bit of fun. So. Um, definitely definitely really useful yeah. for that so besides the the limerick standing wave are we leaving anything out here perhaps if i asked you to sort of pick your uh your kind of you know your, your standout owen mccarthy deering trip from a from a lifetime of travel which one is it oh <laughs> good question oh wow um i think yeah wow that's a that's a good one um yeah i think i think it would have to be the the western um sumatra one it was just oh, so this is the one with all the hardship. Yeah, the hardship. <laughs> it was just so feral. It was so touch and go. Um yeah. and then to score waves uh, pretty much solo. Um, you know, uh, was it, it was it was just it was just an amazing experience. And I suppose, yeah, when you're when you're pushing the boundaries uh, of what you think is possible, um in terms of being stuck out in a limb out in a desert desert island or deserted island um on your own and just fending for yourselves and uh you know coming back out the other side with some 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 amazing tube time memories is uh it's definitely definitely one that stands out in my head well owen you know that the uh the welsh welcome uh, remains open next time you're able to make it over how do I pronounce that famous Gaelic greeting? I'm going to make a fool of myself here now, aren't I? Uh, Cade Mila Falcher. Sinead Gajira, Cade Mila Falcher, uh, 100,000. Did I say it okay? You did. You said it spot on. I don't know what, the, we don't really have anything as cool as that in Welsh. I suppose the 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 closest um, is probably Hoyle, which is a sort of, I suppose, a Welsh word for sort of, you know, friendship and, uh, you know, or I suppose Croeso Croes Gumri would probably be too simple. Welcome to Wales. Anyway, how, how would I say thanks for coming on Crest in Gaelic? Um Gurmila Margot as a ver aircrest as a ver kind aircrest. Gurmila Margot as a ver kind aircrest. Gavila Margot as a vela 
Contra Crest. Yeah, so um, <laughs> oh, right now, I'll simplify. Oh, Gurmil Margaret. Maybe I need another lesson down the line. Gurmil, we well, could just say uh, thank you very much from Crest. So Gurmil Margaret O Crest. Okay. Gurmil Margaret O Crest. O Crest. Because because you could never say thank you enough times to anyone who's good enough to listen to an episode of Crest either. Um, and listeners, don't forget that you can also subscribe to us now on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and uh, Google Podcasts. We are now on that as well, as well as YouTube, uh, where you'll be able to see the rest of our interviews and specials so far. We also love to hear from you. So if you have any thoughts or ideas for us, then do let us know by emailing castcrest at gmail.com. And of course, with autumn underway, there's plenty of swell on the horizon, so say hi to us in the water too. Although to do that to Owen, you may need to be slab hunting somewhere remote after camping. Anyway, wherever you do your surfing, then enjoy, take care, and see you soon. Hoyle Vaur, Aguera Chietro and Essa. Mila Bleakis, that's up. Daystruct Aircrest. Thanks very much for listening on Crest. You, thanks Tom. One, two,